Mano Negra, Senor Matanza, here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. A landmark case returns to a New York district court today, seeking millions of dollars in reparations from corporations that supported and profited from South African apartheid. The suit is filed on behalf of thousands of apartheid victims under the Alien Tort Claims Act. It seeks damages from the companies for doing business with the apartheid regime despite international sanctions and boycotts. The companies include the oil giants BP and ExxonMobil, banks such as Citigroup and UBS, and the car giants General Motors and Ford Motor. The case was initially dismissed in November 2004, but reinstated last October. The Supreme Court was set to rule on the case in May, but sent it back to district court after four justices disclosed they own shares in some of the companies named in the suit. District Court Judge John Sprizo will preside over the hearings. He made the initial ruling to dismiss the case nearly four years ago. My guest is one of South African apartheid victims who came to New York to testify. In apartheid South Africa of the 60s, the poet, Dennis Brutus, was an outspoken activist against the racist state. He helped secure South Africa's suspension from the Olympics, eventually forcing the country to be expelled from the Games in 1970. Arrested in 1963, he was sentenced to 18 months of hard labor on Robben Island off Cape Town with Nelson Mandela. Dennis Brutus was banned from teaching, writing, and publishing in South Africa. His first collection of poetry, Sirens, Knuckles, and Boots, was published in Nigeria while he was in prison. After he was released, Dennis Brutus fled South Africa on a, at that time, Rhodesian passport in 83. After a protracted legal struggle, Dennis Brutus won the right to stay in the United States as a political refugee. He has since become professor emeritus in the Department of Africana Studies at the University of Pittsburgh and professor at South Africa's University of KwaZulu-Natal. Dennis Brutus celebrates it's uh, his 84th birthday later this year. He joins us now in the studio. Welcome to Democracy Now! Thank you very much. Good to be here. Well, you are sitting in our firehouse studio uh, just down the road from the court you will be in in a few minutes. Can you tell us about the significance of this case, Dennis Brutus? Well, of course, it's a fight for South Africans, the victims of apartheid. But when we challenge the behavior of the corporations, it seems to me that relates also to corporations in other parts of the world. So we're really doing a local attack, but also a global attack. I think the two go together. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, where people came and testified, they got amnesty if they told the truth, even if they were talking about massacres, the brutal murders of South Africans. Um, the corporation part of it, track of it, didn't get much attention. Right. Although they were invited to testify and indeed to acknowledge their complicity, but they just turned a deaf ear to it. So, in fact, they got off very lightly. Can you talk about these corporations and what they did? How did they help the apartheid regime? Right. Well, I grew up in Port Elizabeth, for instance, which was the headquarters both of Ford and GM, and they were using black labor. But it was very cheap black labor because there was a law in South Africa which said, A, blacks are not allowed to join trade unions, and B, they're not allowed to strike, so that they were forced to accept whatever wages they were given. They lived in ghettos, in some cases near where I lived, actually in the boxes in which the parts had been shipped from the U.S. to be assembled in South Africa. So you had a whole township called Qua Ford, meaning the place of Ford, and it was all Ford boxes with the name Ford on them, because they were addressed to Ford in Port Elizabeth. Now, what is striking is that when I appeared before the, the GM stockholders meeting in Detroit, and I raised the question on behalf of the American churches, what do you pay the blacks in South Africa? The stockholders voted they didn't want to be told. A 98 percent vote which said we don't want to be told. So obviously the complicity was both at the top executive level, but also with the stockholders themselves. When did you ask that question? At that time, I was teaching at Northwestern University. It would mean the early 70s. Hmm. Uh, the other corporations um, that you are seeking damages against in this landmark case, ExxonMobil and BP? Well, the same sort of thing. 
cheap labor, exploited labor, and no levels of managerial or management position at all. So it's consistent discrimination against blacks on the basis of race, which pays off, of course, in starvation wages. In some cases, the corporations took out space in the newspapers to announce that we are loyal citizens of South Africa, we accept the laws of South Africa, so they were actually declaring the fact that for them, apartheid was a very good system, it was a very profitable system. The South African government is not supporting you in this lawsuit. Right. Has actually um, obeyed the Bush administration demands that they oppose the lawsuit. Right. They filed a brief asking the judge to dismiss our application. And this was filed by the South African Minister of Justice on behalf of the government. When he stepped down, the minister who took over after Maduna was succeeded by someone called Bridget Mabandla, she reaffirmed the application that the application that we had made should be dismissed, said there should be no reparations. Your response? Well, it seems to me it's perhaps uh, the most dramatic example we have of a government choosing to support the corporations in opposition to its own citizens. So when the citizens are victims and the corporations are the beneficiaries, the government comes out in support of the corporations. We're going to have to leave it there, but we will follow the case and we will report on what happens this morning. This is Democracy Now! Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Sharif Abdokadus, Aramate Angeli Khanma, Jeffrey Hagerman, Steve Martinez, Nicole Salazar, Hani Massoud, Robbie Karen, Mike DeFilippo, Miguel Nagara, Peter Curry's our engineers. Thanks also to Becca Staley, Hugh Grant, Samantha Chambly, Jay Sumner, John Randolph, Laura Chipley, Kieran Krug Meadows, Vesta Godars. Our website is democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.